Good morning, Right Reverend Sir, delegates and friends. I'm pleased to be with you this morning and to tell you about the exciting work of the Episcopal Health Foundation. I could spend the rest of our time together regaling you with the interesting work we're doing, but I'm going to talk about a couple of items today and hope that this will entice you to check out our website and contact us so that you can learn more about what we're doing. So I want to talk about three things today. First, I want to talk about our approach to improving community health in the 57 counties in which we serve. And then I want to talk about the work we do with our congregations. Others have spoken about that. I want to try to bring it all together this morning. And then I want to talk to you about the grant making that we have done as we begin our sixth year of operations. So first of all, our approach to health is exemplified by this hashtag that we are trying to build a following to use. And it's a simple concept once you get your head around it, and that it's, we're talking about health, not just health care. We have a conversation in this country where we use the words health and health care interchangeably, and people think that if you get health care, then you have health. And that's just not true. Let me share some information that explains that. So if you want to improve health, then you have to know what drives health. What is it that creates a healthy person, a healthy family, a healthy community? And there's a whole lot of data from decades of study that shows what actually determines health. And these are those factors. So first of all, we have social and economic factors, and that includes things like income and employment. It also includes the work we do together as a church. It has to do with cohesion, social cohesion, uh, engagement within communities, the kinds of spiritual care and support that we show for one another where we help people who otherwise would experience isolation and loneliness. Those kinds of factors are 40% of what determines whether a person is going to be healthy or not. Another 30% is attributable to health behaviors. So are, what is your diet like? Are you getting exercise? Are you smoking? Are you abusing drugs or alcohol? And a lot of the time we talk about that as if it is an individual's responsibility. If you're not eating well, it's your fault and you've created an unhealthy lifestyle for yourself and therefore you, that's what you get. What we often overlook though are that many people are not able to lead a healthy lifestyle through no fault of their own. If you live in a community where you can't go out and walk in the neighborhood because it's not safe, then telling someone, well, you can get exercise, go walk, doesn't really do any good. Likewise, if you don't have access to healthy food, either because you can't afford it or it's not in your neighborhood, and you're working two jobs, it's really not fair to say to someone, well, you just should eat better. And so we need to address health behaviors and our responsibility to enable people to live healthy lives. 20% of what constitutes health comes from clinical care. And a lot of times when I give this talk, uh, the doctors in the audience say, but what about us? Doesn't it matter? And the answer is yes, it absolutely matters. It's critically important that we have access to high quality, affordable health care. But it only accounts for 20% of our health factors. And then lastly, 10% has to do with environmental factors. Uh, are you living in safe housing? Uh, does your apartment have mold in it? And if it does, there's not a lot you can do about it personally. You can't improve your health if you're living where you're exposed to mold all the time. If you live in an area that has air pollution or groundwater pollution, what are the opportunities for you to be healthy if that is beyond your control? If you don't have transportation, how can you get to the places you need to go? And so what's um, disturbing to us at Episcopal Health Foundation and the narrative we're trying to change is that we are investing the bulk of our health dollars in the 20% health care slice. So the left part of this slide is exactly the slide from before. What are the determinants and what percentage uh, are they responsible for your health outcomes? On the right side, that is our $3.5 trillion 
in national health expenditures. And what you can see from this is almost all of it is going into health care. And it's not that health care isn't critical, it's just that it's a little slice of the pie. And so our mission is to change that. Let me show you how it works in some other countries. So we are your Episcopal data geek, so bear with me for a couple of slides. Uh, the light blue part of each of these bars is the percentage of GDP that each of these countries spends on health care. You can see in the U.S. column that we are spending more as a percentage of GDP, and because we have the largest economy, more dollars than any other country on health care. We are spending the least on what internationally they call social care, what we would call the social determinants of health, all of these non-medical factors that impact whether or not you're healthy. But let's look at some data. This is life expectancy in those countries. And you, what you see from this slide is that we are spending the most on health care, we are spending the least on the non-medical factors that contribute to health, and our life expectancy is the lowest among all of these developed countries. I could draw the line up here for infant mortality. Can we keep babies alive for a year? We're the worst. I could show you the same data for obesity rates. We're the worst. And I could show you the same data for the health of older people. We're the worst. We spend more on medical care and less on non-medical factors than any other country, and we are getting lousy results. And so what do we do with this information? Our approach has been to work alongside others who understand this discrepancy between where we spend our money and where our health outcomes are. And there's actually a great conversation going on in the country right now, uh, even at the federal government level, about repositioning some of our expenditures so that they are actually delivering health. There's nothing wrong with spending three and a half trillion dollars on health. What's wrong to me is that we're not getting the outcomes for it. So how can we do something different with those dollars in order to get better outcomes? And we are fortunate that we are able to work at a systems level with people at the federal and state and local governments because that's where the action really is. And we are trying to influence those systems. Let me give you a couple of examples. Uh, yesterday, in our offices, at the request of the Federal Health and Human Services Agency, we hosted the conference for the three sites within Texas that are working on a federally funded program that invest more money in the determinants, the social determinants of health, and less money in medical care. And the federal government came to us as a neutral convener to host the three Texas grantees, one from Houston, one from Dallas, and one from San Antonio. We are also working with the state Medicaid agency. Medicaid pays for the health care costs of more than four million Texans, mostly poor children. And we are working along with Dell Medical School to help the state Medicaid agency build in some funding for these non-medical determinants so that, for example, if uh, children are having asthma attacks because their houses have mold in them, why don't we use Medicaid funds to fix those homes? It's cheaper than continuing to pay over and over again for them to go to the emergency room to have their asthma treated. We are doing similar work with county governments uh, across our region. We had a fantastic meeting with both the Deep East Texas Council of Governments and the East Texas Council of Governments in Nacogdoches uh, late last fall where we brought in researchers who are able to analyze local government spending between health care and non-health care and are able to make recommendations about how slight tweaks in spending patterns, not new money, but just change changing spending patterns can actually improve a county's health rankings. And the reason we're working with government agencies is because that's really where the money and power and influence is. And as much money as we have, we can't buy the change that we want to see in the world. And so what we try to do is work alongside those who have the power to make those changes and come alongside them and help them do their work 
where we're aligned, and we are increasingly finding alignment. Um, we are also working closely with both the UT system and the Texas A&M system on their health initiatives. We have a seat at the table now when these large institutions who are so important to the communities we care about, and we are increasingly called upon to work alongside them. That's the influence that we're able to have, and that's where we really are able to do our best work because over the long term, changing the systems and changing the way we finance what actually impacts health is what will lead to more improvements in communities across our diocese. Let me switch topics entirely and talk to you about the work that we do with our congregations. Um, when I started this job, I knew we would be working with our congregations, but I had no idea what it would look like. And we slowly hired staff and we worked with congregations and over time we have been able to develop with our congregations really interesting programs that are meeting the needs of all different congregations, large, small, urban, rural, and I want to tell you about some of those because they're really exciting and for those of you who have participated in any of these, when I talk about something you've been a party to, give us a a big wave of the hand and if you talk to those who are already engaged in some of these programs I hope you'll feel the excitement and reach out to us because our goal is to be able to serve more and more congregations. So the first program, uh, the first thing I want to talk about uh, are the focus areas that we have. So we tend to develop programs around areas that, co that overlap what we are trying to do as a health foundation and also where churches are interested in doing work. And so one of the areas that we're just beginning to get into is poverty. And congregations have worked with, with low-income communities, particularly those who are living in low-income communities for a long time. And we're trying to figure out programming, including training and bridges out of poverty, that will help you work with your Title I schools and work with neighborhoods where the real issue, and I would say often the, the main issue, is poverty. Um, we also do a lot of work in the area of mental health. It was an area that you all told us you were interested in from the beginning. We started that work by bringing mental health first aid trainings to congregations. And so far, way more than 1,000 people have been certified through the mental health first aid training. Now we're ready to go deeper. We want to say, so what? We've trained people to do that. How do we take it to the next level so that congregations are actively involved in mental health initiatives in their community? We also do a lot of work around civic engagement. If you want to work in a community, you need to learn how to do it the right way. We do a lot of this work in partnership with the Mission AMP team from the diocese, and we offer trainings. We have um, organizations that are expert at this that we support so that they can work with congregations. And so far, we've had 31 congregations work specifically in this area. And last but not least, which I would say is the bookend to poverty, is racial reconciliation. If we could fix two factors, it would be poverty and it would be racism. That underlies the majority of health disparities that we see in our communities. And we have an opportunity to make a difference there, whether it's working with the national church or whether it's working with efforts that are going on in each of our communities. And so during this year, we are focused on bringing more programming to congregations in all four of these areas. Next, we have a program called Holy Currencies. And this is a really interesting program because it is essentially a, a strategic planning tool that is gospel-based. And so it, it takes the framing of church teachings but allows you to apply it to solving a community problem. And we have 21 congregations who have participated in Holy Currency so far, and they participate as cohorts, and so there's a group of them, so they get to learn from each other. But basically, it's a many months long process um, that requires a lot of attention uh, and participation on the part of lay and clergy leaders. And they go through this training, and what they end up with after they've done it is uh, a sustainable plan for really meaningful community 
ministry. And there are all sorts of examples around it. Who's done holy currencies? Great, great. Um, we will be fielding another cohort. Uh, be on the lookout for the application process. It'll be, the application process will begin this spring, and then in the fall, we'll start with a new cohort. Um, we also have a kitchen cabinet. This is a group comprised of about 15 to 20 lay and clergy leaders, and they have given us great advice and great insight, and they also act as champions for us, uh, where they go out and talk to their peers to let them know what the opportunities are with the Episcopal Health Foundation. And they meet a few times during the year, and I, I really would say that with, without their support, we would be hanging out here alone trying to do this work, and we would not have gotten nearly as far as we have in reaching congregations and really making programming that congregations are interested in. Uh, we also have an opportunity uh, to expand uh, working with Episcopal Health Foundation. Last year, we had a one-day session called In Common, and it was in Houston, and it was really a beginner session. If you haven't worked with us before and you want to learn about all of the opportunities we have, we called people together. Well, it was oversubscribed, and so what we've done this year is we're going to have three different sessions, one in March at Good Shepherd in Austin, one in May at St. James in Houston, and one in June at Christ Episcopal in Tyler. And this is an opportunity for clergy and laymen to come to this session, learn about the work that we do, and learn from those of us who are already involved in the work and hopefully bring you into the next uh, round of work. Uh, lastly, we do a lot of capacity building. We have a number of staff members who work specifically with our congregation, for people who do nothing but congregation work. But we also have others in the organization. This is a picture of, of Troy Bush D. Donato, who does community engagement training, and he will come out and work with your congregation and your community on training. We also underwrite the costs of various kinds of consultants that many congregations have needed to advance their ministries. And we now have peer-to-peer -peer learning cohorts so that those of you who are doing the work can teach others because you're actually better teachers than we are from our office in Houston. Uh, these are the expenses that we have paid just out of pocket in the last four years in support of the ministries. Um, and it doesn't include any of the costs of our staff, which is the real value you get from Episcopal Health Foundation, is working with our staff and the consultants that we can bring with to you to help you um, learn how to do this great work. Now I'm going to switch tracks entirely and talk about our five years of grant making. Let me start at the highest level. So since our inception, we have made grants totaling $303 million. Let me break that down, and then I'll go into more detail on some of the specific uh, tracks. So the first number up there, the 57 point uh, $7 million in hospital transfer grants were some grants that were made in connection with the transfer of the hospital system. Um, you can think of them as closing costs on the transaction in a way. Um, the $126 million is, of course, the funding to the Great Commission Foundation, and you all have been exposed to the work of that foundation, including its new commitment to, um, to uh, the campus ministries. Um, the next number on there is the $30 million, that's $5 million a year, in support of clergy health insurance. Then there's an $18 million uh, number on there that represents grants we have made that are related to diocesan work, and I have a slide to show you what that uh, comprises. And then lastly, uh, $71.5 million to all of these other community-based organizations throughout the 57 counties that are improving the health in their communities. So this is uh, a list of the diocesan grants. You can see that we have supported diocesan institutions directly. There are also a number of organizations that um, are related to the diocese, created by the diocese, uh, or by churches in many instances, and they're now independent nonprofits. They're still closely tied and sometimes controlled by by parishes, and those are organizations that we provide grant funding to. And then there's a smaller category 
of grants that have arisen because of the action of congregations. You have brought to us opportunities to fund organizations that we may not have known about, or you have brought to us ideas for community programs that we may not have known about, and so we keep track of that as well. So here's how the programmatic, the, the grants break down. Um, this 87 million includes the, the 71 million and a little bit more of um, the diocesan related grants. Th this is only through 2017 and the reason we present this data separate from 18 is because we have a new strategic plan and we categorize our grants differently. But Almost uh, $90 million um, went out between 2013 and 2017, uh, the majority of it in access to health services, uh, next in community-based primary care, and then the third largest category is in mental health and wellness. Under our new strategic plan, we've, we have um, recategorized our grants. We're not doing anything all that different, but we think about them differently because our new strategic plan is built around four outcomes. Everything we fund flows through one of these outcomes. And so here they are. The um, access to care grant is the largest slice. Part of the reason for that is because it includes the $5 million for um, diocesan health insurance but it would be really large otherwise. We spend a lot of resources on trying to get people enrolled in benefits and trying to increase access to care, whether it's through care on the ground that clinics are providing or whether it's through organizations that are working to ensure that more people have access to care. Um, our next largest state is the space is in health system reform. The work I've described to you at the beginning falls into that category. How do we change our system so that it's actually delivering health and not just health care? Um, uh, the last two slices are, are really about TIDE. Activate Communities is where we support the work that has to do with community-based organizations that are lifting up voices that will speak truth to power and that will get engaged in helping residents get what they need from institutions and from the governmental organizations that are meant to serve them. And then the early childhood brain development, which is really our newest and I would say most exciting area, is focused on how you do the work between one loving caregiver and one child from age zero to three where you can physiologically change the structure of a baby's brain that can build the pathway for a lifetime of health. And you have this unique opportunity between zero and three. It's not expensive. Anyone can do it, and we are finding an increasing number of partners who are interested in doing this. So this backs up way before um, child care or before um, school readiness. It, it's something about changing the nature of the brain of a baby, and it's really exciting, and we love the fact that there are so many organizations getting into this kind of work. Um, let me close by bringing you back uh, in dollars to the beginning. So the, the transfer uh, yielded $1.26 billion. Our net assets as of the end of 2018 were $1.156 billion. Uh, I'm ha happy to report that our January numbers are in and we recovered the losses that pretty much everybody in the market sustained during 2018, and we're now back up to $1.2 billion again. So after the years of operations, and after the grants have been made, and after the non-grant funding, which includes all of the other work we do, we're back to where we started. And we have a long-term view of our investment portfolio. We don't look at what happened last month or last quarter even to make decisions about where we're going, but over the long haul, we are seeing that our investments are paying off and we are able to maintain the purchasing power and at the same time deliver excellent opportunities throughout our diocese. That completes my report for the year, uh, right, Reverend Sir, and I thank you all for the privilege of serving you in this capacity.